Good morning, everyone. Morning. You're welcome to our service of worship, whether you're here in God's house or whether you're worshiping online. If you're visiting us, we give you a special welcome. We also welcome back David Fenton, and we're looking forward to your message, David, from God's Word and leading us in our worship. There'll be tea and coffee after church in the main hall, and everyone's welcome to join us there for that. There'll be two home groups meeting this week. On Tuesday the 17th, a group led by Alec will meet at 4 Kilcairn at 7.30. And on Thursday the 19th, a group led by Alan and Wendy will meet in 8 Donegal Rides, also at 7.30. The next meeting of session will be on Tuesday, the 24th of May, at half past seven in the Minor Hall. The Ladies' Coffee Group will meet in the Goblins Cafe and McGee at half past ten on Wednesday. The coffee men know theirs is on Tuesday at quarter to eleven, and all men are welcome to that. Uh, Planning for the afternoon tea celebration is well underway. This is for the Queen's Platinum Jubilee and it will be held on Friday the 3rd of June. There are sign-up sheets in the vestibule and it's helpful if you can sign up as soon as possible so that we can gauge how much food will be needed. And then next week we have sheets uh, giving the opportunity to contribute food. Uh, decorations and a large cake have been planned and the um, assured that the plans are all very exciting for this. The Ramblers are going on the second walk of the season tomorrow. It's a shorter walk than last time, so we'll be meeting at, down at the station to board the 11.30 train to Lawn Town Station, walking along Sandy Bay Promenade towards Glenarm Road back to the Prom Cafe for lunch at quarter to, twi- quarter to one, and then back on the five to two train to Whitehead. So if you want to go on the Ramble tomorrow, 11.30 at the station to head to Larne. This is Christian Aid Week, uh, starting today, and the focus is twofold this year. Firstly, the continuing drought situation in Zimbabwe, and also the refugee crisis in Ukraine. Envelopes like this are available on the vestibule and these envelopes will be returned to the local Christian aid representative unopened. So if you're putting a cheque in the envelope, follow the instructions on it and make it out to Christian aid and not to the church. Next week's service of worship on the 22nd will be led by the Reverend Dr. Alan Russell. These are all the announcements. Thank you, Mr. Glad once again, it's wonderful to be here, sharing with you and fellowship together. I was getting slightly better, but maybe a bit more weather owing to the weather forecast I was looking. Just a few words from Proverbs chapter 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all that you do, and he will show you which path to take. Do not be impressed by your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. Let's just pray together. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity we have of meeting around your word. Help us to settle our hearts and our minds from the busyness of this morning. Help us to open our hearts with your word has to speak to us today. Then we leave this place blessed and having met with your holy presence. Guide us and direct us. Pray that we may learn something new this morning from your word. May your word open up our hearts and our minds, that we may go forth into this week being changed and make us people who you want us to be. We ask it in your name's sake. Amen. 
Our next piece sent out our choir. Uh, afterwards, we shall stand and sing together. So, we go to the choir. <laughs> Oh, no. 
Thank you for the choir for that wonderful introduction. It's good to learn something new. When I come before God and we bring before Him our prayers, I know this has been a difficult and confusing week for many of us, and nothing surprising for politicians. Uh, we know that things are continuing in our world and have to be frustrated and maybe even angry at what's happening. But let's just pray before God this morning. Lord, we pray that we confess that we have not been the people we ought to be. Lord, we have said those things that we know we should not have said. Lord, it's so easy to say them that we find it much more difficult to take them back. Lord, we often pray for forgiveness. We find it harder to forgive others. We pray that you be with us, watch over us and guide us. Lord, make us into the people that you want us to be. Lord, often we put ourselves before you and before others. We want our way and no way. Just bless us and guide us now. Shape us into your people to be with us. We thank you for coming down and dying upon the cross for us. We thank you that you rose on the third day and are watching over us. We thank you, Lord, that you sent your Holy Spirit to guide and direct us. We praise and glorify your name. We thank you, Lord, that one day you are coming back to us. The pain and suffering of this world will be no more. And governments will learn who is the true ruler of this earth. Lord, we pray for this word of ours at this time. Lord, we know we continue to watch scenes of war and violence on our streets. We pray for the victims of the shooting in America. Lord, we find it hard to accept and believe, Lord, and find it so hard to understand why anyone would do this. We pray, Lord, for the war in Ukraine, for your people there. Lord, we have seen violence on our television scenes. Lord, we have seen the shooting of these two innocent men going about their daily job. Lord, we find it hard to understand how anyone can justify this as an act of war. Lord, we pray for our own land. Lord, we have seen once again our politics situation, Lord. Lord, we pray that you would move our leaders, Lord. Pray that you would find a resolve for this impasse, that our people may have the operations they deserve and are finally in need of, that our schools may have the funding they so much need. For Lord, all the ongoing work for our hospitals and staff there. Pray for all our doctors and nurses and medical staff, for teachers and classroom assistants and all those who drive our buses. Lord, as we enter a week where our transport system is coming to a halt, we pray for the resolution of this dispute, Lord, the way may be found. Pray for this congregation, commit it into your hands and into your safekeeping. Pray for all who needs, pray for the session meeting, that you bless and guide. And for all who are taking part in the different activities of the, this week in this church, just be with them, bless and guide them, we pray, and keep them safe. Lord, just pray for our church and the wider family. Wherever your word is spoken this morning, that you know your guiding hand may be upon them, that it be used for the glory of Christ and for Christ alone. Just pray and commit all our prayers into your holy name. We ask it in your name's sake. Our reading this morning is taken from Colossians, continuing on at chapter 1, commencing at verse 15 to the end. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He exists before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him God created everything in the heavens, realms, and on the earth. He made every kingdoms, rulers, authorities, and unseen world. 
Everything was created through him and for him. He exists before anything else. He holds all creation together. Christ is the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. He is the first in everything. God in all his fullness was pleased to dwell in Christ, and through him reconciled God everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood upon the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through his death in Christ of his physical body. As a result, he brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Do not drift away from the assurance you received if you heard the good news. The good news has been preached over all the world, and I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servants to proclaim it. I am glad when I suffer for you in the body. I am participating in the suffering of Christ to continue in his body, the church. God has given me a responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you. This message is kept secret for generations past, but now it's revealed to God's people. For God wanted them to know the riches and glory of Christ for you, the Gentiles, too. For this secret Christ lived in you. He gave you assurance of sharing his glory. So we may tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone all the wisdom God has given us. We want to present them to God perfect in their relationship to Christ. That is why I work and struggle so hard, depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. We pray that God may richly bless the reading of this holy word. Now stand together and sing the church's one foundation, number one by two. <laughs>
After quite a gap for our missionary topic this month, we focus on PCI's partner churches in India and Indonesia. <coughs> Indonesia is the world's fourth most populous nation. 250 million people, 17 and a half thousand islands. Islam is the country's dominant religion, with Christianity at 16%. Sadly, in the past, there has been ethnic and religious violence. There is still intense Islamic extremism and persecution of Christians in some areas. Yet, there has also been great blessing and Christian churches are growing. PCI partners with three church denominations on the smaller islands of Sumba, Timor and Halmahera. On Sumba, 80% of the people are Christian, mostly members of the Christian Church of Sumba. Many of its congregations are vacant or oversized and leadership training is a priority. The church has a school of theology and runs two hospitals and some schools. On Timor, the Evangelical Christian Church in Timor is the second largest Protestant church in Indonesia, with one and a half million members, who as people are among the poorest in Indonesia. This church runs a radio station, Voice of Love. PCI's partnering began in 1972 when the Reverend Ken and Valerie Newell were there. Sumba and Timor were hit with a severe cyclone on Easter Sunday last year, 2021, suffering major damage to roads and bridges and loss of life. Four manses and two churches have had to be rebuilt. PCI has donated £20,000 to help in this. On PCI's website, their news section, there is an excellent article with photographs and maps from April to report progress on this rebuilding one year on. On Halmahera, the Evangelical Christian Church of Halmahera serves 50% of the population and has a strong emphasis on mission, despite Halmahera seeing the worst of Islam Christianity violence around the year 2000. This church has a Christian university and theological college which PCI supports with scholarships and public publishing. Early last year, a PCI grant also helped to provide a speedboat to reach churches on the 781 islands covered by this denomination. You may have heard of these islands before under their historical name of the Spice Islands. PCI's partnering on Halmahera also began in 1972 under the Reverend James and Mary Hare. In Indonesia, with great numerical growth in the churches and with surrounding contrary beliefs, there is a very great need for the training of more ministers and for committed discipleship among believers. With so many languages also, over 700, the need for Bible translation is enormous and is a vast, unfinished task. Also this month, we remember another PCI partnered church in the East, the Gujarati Speaking Church of North India. This also has one in a third million members and is vibrant and growing, despite significant persecution from militant Hindu extremists. Sympathetic with the present government in India, they wish to rid India of all Christians and Muslims, agitating that all Indians should and must be Hindu. There have been thousands of attacks on Christians and churches, and nine states in India now have anti-conversion laws. India is in the top ten list of countries in the world where it is hardest to be a Christian. We bring these, our brothers and sisters, in these churches in both countries now to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we bless you for your great name 
power and working above all false gods and empty philosophies in our world today. We bless you for your great love and for your great salvation brought to us in Jesus. He who knew no sin but was made sin for us, that we might know the righteousness of God. He who fulfilled the prophecy of his name because he saves from sin and its punishment. We praise you, Almighty God, for your great blessing on those who in the past courageously took this your gospel of grace to the people of India and Indonesia. Thank you for many lives transformed by new life in Jesus. We bring before you our committed colleagues and fellow believers in Gujarati, North India, and in Sumba, Timor, and Halmahera. We seek your anointing on their leaders, on their spoken, broadcast, and publication ministries, and on their hospitals, schools, and faculties of theology. We pray you will draw many more into these to serve the many congregations of your people. Lord, may your Holy Spirit's powerful blessing and protection be over all this vibrant witness and on those engaged in Bible translation. We bring before you those in both countries suffering persecution for your name's sake. Please sustain them with strength and courage. May they know your name to be a strong tower in which they find security and peace. We pray you will help your believers to live graciously with others, Muslim and Hindu, and we pray your hand of restraint to be on those motivated by extremism and by hostility to your name. We ask particularly for true religious freedom in India, so your people can worship you freely, without fear and without discrimination in society. We thank you with joy for new believers in India coming to Jesus because you have been healing many of sicknesses. We thank you too for our previous colleagues, the Benjamins, who came from India and served you faithfully among Gujaratis in London for 30 years. Bless them in their retirement, we pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you meet the needs in both countries of those suffering COVID and of those who suffered loss in last year's destructive cyclone in Indonesia. We offer our prayers to you, loving God, in Jesus' name, a name we pray will be increasingly honoured throughout our world. Amen. Thank you, George. I'm sure you all agree that was extremely challenging. I know certainly I was challenged by what George has told us about churches in India and Indonesia. And I think often we forget how grateful we are to be here, to allow to come and to worship God freely without fear, persecution, or arrest, or even death. Just I just remember during that this week, those who are living under fear and death or having to come to worship and praise God together. This morning I want to bring up God's word from Colossians 1, 15 to 29. <clears throat> if you have a Bible, you'll know that certainly says on mine probably Christ is supreme. And that is the title I want to give this morning's sermon. To summarise last week, we discovered that Paul was in prison, although not in a prison that we would know of. Rather, he is under house arrest. He was able to have visitors and write letters. Um, here we are reading one such letter. Paul was writing because of reports of heresy in the church called Gnosticism. Counteract this, Paul sought to remind us of the person of Christ that in Christ they have all they needed. 
He showed up about saying they had heard great things about the faith and their fruits of the spirits. They had been displaying. He told them he was praying for them continually. And that does, of course, mean he was praying 24 7. But it meant that he was praying regularly. Of course, we're asked to do exactly the same. Paul asked God to fulfill their, him with their knowledge. False teachers had arisen within the church and they were corrupting the gospel. Before we move on to the next section of this passage, it is important to outline the heresy Paul was writing about. Although this was written some 2,000 years ago, many of the beliefs outlined still exist today. So it's important that we are able to counteract those who would still proclaim them. The heresy was that the spirit is good or the world as we know it is evil. This is clearly false. God created both heaven and earth for his glory. Both are equal. The second part is that we must follow ceremonies. Rituals are man-made restrictions in order to be saved. Also, this is one of the greatest dangers in our church we impose on people is they follow what we do and the way we do it. All of these came to an end when Christ died upon the cross. He died for our sins. He paid the price for us. The story of the veil in the temple was torn in two. There are no more human rituals we need to obey, but we have free access to Christ. Thirdly, we must deny the body. Denying the body is meant to help us to conquer our thoughts. Rather, it can lead to pride. Luther discovered that no matter how much he denied his body, he was still not spiritually fulfilled. Fourthly, the angels must be worshipped. We hear a lot about this today. The truth is, only Christ is worthy of worship. I know in the last few years, people have gone through awful times. And they've looked for some sign of hope. We hear an awful lot about feathers and various things that people look for, contact with the ones who have passed. I know they're looking for something, of some port of contact, something to give them hope. But only Christ is worthy of worship, and Christ alone. Fifthly, they stated that Christ could not be human and divine. Christ was God in flesh. He had the same feelings as we do. He was hungry, tired, and often he displayed our same emotions. He felt pain. He is suffering for us today. If we deny that, how can we claim that God is with us when we suffer? Rather, he knows our suffering, he understands us. He knows our different complexities that we go through. Sexually, we must obtain secret knowledge or passwords. I don't know about you, but I've read enough passwords in the last two or three years to take me for the rest of my life. When my first went to Union College, we learned about Gnosticism and passwords. Um, generally, I ignored it because passwords were something we didn't know much too much about. But nowadays, it seems that you, no matter what you do in your life, you need a password for it, or you're ordering oil or ordering clothes or food, you must remember the pa password. And there's a book in our house, it used to be telephone numbers, but natural passwords. But rather, the gospel is open to all. Gnostics believe we must obtain human wisdom and knowledge. But Christ provided all that we need. 
We must follow his words, not man-made wisdom. True wisdom comes from God. They believed that it is better to combine religions. And this is the belief of some church leaders, that we all worship the same God. Surely, if we all worship the same God, why would other religions be persecuting us? No. Christ alone is our God and the only way to salvation. Christ alone is the only way we can have salvation. It cannot be found in anywhere else or any other faith. People have a right to their beliefs and we should respect them for all of and we should ask for the same respect. But we know that Christ alone can be our needs. They believed that there was nothing wrong with immorality and sin. But Christ and sin cannot exist alongside. No sin is harmless. We must follow the teaching of Christ and not of those of the world. We must not lead to friends or family for advice on what they believe. Rather, we should stick to the Word of God and what the Word of God tells us is right or wrong. Christ alone is our guide and direction, and we should seek Him and Him alone. Commencing at verse 15, Paul starts off with one of the strongest statements about the divine nature of Christ. Jesus is not only equal to God, he is God. Let me just repeat that again. He is not equal to God. He is God. Many faiths believe that Jesus was a good man. Many even state the Islam that he was a prophet. But Paul here is clearly stating that Jesus is the image of God. <coughs> He uses the word an exact representation of God. Not only does he reflect God, but he reveals God to us. He is the firstborn of all creation. He was there at the start of creation. Or if we're being perfectly correct, he was there before creation. He has the priority of the firstborn prince in God's kingdom. Here it's slightly confusing because in worldly terms we could say that he is mixed in line. But he is also equal with God. Nearest thing we could possibly state it is if you look back to the opening of Parliament the other day where Prince Charles stood in for the Queen. Here he was acting on behalf of the Queen, but he was also equal to the Queen and has given them special powers for that day. Jesus really has those powers. He is serving God, but he is equal with God. Christ came from heaven. And like most of us who come from the dust of the ground, he returned to heaven. If we believe in him, we shall go to be with him in glory. He is Lord of all. He is completely holy. He alone has the authority to judge the world. Therefore, Christ is supreme over all creation, including the spiritual and material world. We must accept the deity of Christ. If we fail to do so, our faith is hollow and meaningless. This is a central truth of being part of God's family. I know this is perhaps heavy going, but if we do not grasp what Paul is saying to hear us here, then perhaps we should lose, our, lose the right to be here in worship Christ. Perhaps it would be better if we close the doors at Christ 
was of the head of the church. Christ alone must be the head. This is not a white head thing or a downshark thing, but it is true of every church. Everywhere where Christ is represented, he alone must be the head. Short time I've stopped with you and shared together. I know your great belief that I share with you. The Christ is yours and the Christ should be glorified. If we are to move forward, this should be our aim and our purpose. Not that man is glorified, but Christ is glorified. Paul clearly believed that all he needed was in Christ. He sought to clear up any misconceptions about Jesus. The Colossian church leaders argued that God could not have came to heaven, to dirt from heaven, in a truly human form. Paul argues that Christ was the exact likeness of God. If he died upon the cross as a human being, I ask the Christ to take on our sins upon himself. He had to be human, yet he was without sin. As the Son of God, he alone could bear our sins. They believed that God did not create the world, as God could not have created evil. This has been a very deep theological question for years. But Paul argues that Christ, as God, is the creator of both heaven and earth. He argued that Christ was not unique, but rather one of many. Paul goes on to explain that Christ existed before anything. They refused to see Christ as the source of salvation. They believed people could find knowledge through special and secret knowledge. We know this is not true. Rather, Paul proclaims that salvation is found in Christ alone. We are reminded of those wonderful words that him we should sing later on. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. Because they argued that God himself could create the world, they reasoned that Christ would be in charge of the spiritual world alone. Paul goes on to say to Christ that all rulers, powers, authority, both physical and spiritual, were created under the authority of Christ. Something all governments should remember, all powers, all who claim authority in this world should remember, that they only exist as long as God desires them to be. God is creator of this world. He is also its sustainer. He holds everything together. Nothing can exist independent of him. <laughs> As for his servants, he protects us. He cares for us and sustains us. We must trust in him alone. Christ is the firstborn from among the dead. Because he rose from the dead, he has lordship over the material world. All who trust in him will also rise to go to live with him forever. Because he is supreme, we should give him the first place in our thoughts and activities. In verse 19, Paul refutes the Greek idea that Jesus did not be human and divine. He has always got being God and always will be God. We should never diminish any aspect of the nature of Christ in its humanity or divinity. Through Christ's death provided a way for all of us to have a relationship with Christ. We can be reconciled with him. The price is has been paid. There is no other way except through Christ. Acts 4.12 reminds us, 
Salvation is found in no other way. There is no other name under heaven given to which mankind by which we must be saved. Whilst we are alien from God, we are strangers to his plan. Sin has corrupted our thoughts. None of us is good enough to save ourselves. We cannot work to our, to our salvation. Our faith and our works must go hand in hand. But works must be re a result of faith, not the other way around. We must trust in his grace. Perhaps we have never committed a murder. But maybe our thoughts have led us that direction. Maybe they have not been totally pure. Maybe our thoughts is not something we would like to be broadcast in our church. Maybe you have what you believe have led a perfect life. Being a regular church goer, an expanding citizen, but apart from faith in Christ, there is no other salvation. Paul explains in 20, verse 22, that Jesus had to be fully human in order to die for our sins. We need to be established and firm in our faith in him. In 23, he explains that when God forgives our sins, our record is wiped clean. It is like we have never sinned. I know it's a complicated situation of a forgiveness. The only way I can explain it is, if you have a row with someone, you have an argument over something petty, perhaps, and you come to that person and say, well, I forgive you, let's meet up for coffee. The person says, yes, I forgive you, let's meet up. And perhaps you have forgiven each other, <coughs> But the back of your mind, you're thinking, well, let's not mention football or politics to that person because that will set them off. We haven't truly forgotten the sin or the problem that caused the argument in the first place. For God, it is different. He has blotted out from his memory the sin that we committed. In verse 24, Paul talks about the vexed question of suffering. He states that Christian suffering can lead to be endured and joyful. It can change lives and bring people into the kingdom of God. A very good friend of mine was once asked, why are you suffering? Her answer was, well, why not? This was a person who most people would have admired and looked up to. And she's right, why am I not suffering while others are suffering? Suffering can lead other people into the kingdom of God. How we treat suffering can be a wonderful example for those around about us. In 26 and 27, Paul states that God's secret plan was Jesus. His plan of salvation that was not made known to man before, but is now open to all. In 28 uses the word to describe believers. He talks about perfection. He is not talking about people who are flawless, but rather maturing in the faith. And Christ calls us, each one of us, to mature, to grow to become more like him. People often give their testimony and it's a story of all the bad things they have done in their life and then Christ saved them. And that's the end of the story. But that's not what God wants us to be. Our testimony must be what Christ is doing in our lives. How we are growing in our faith and our walk with him. Paul concludes that Christ's message is open to everyone. All can come to Christ. Without Christ, mankind is doomed. There is no other alternative. There is no other way. If we read this passage and study it together, hopefully you have time to read it. 
Let's try and apply it to our hearts and our lives as we go through this week, knowing that Christ alone is with us and watching over us. He alone knows our suffering and our pain. He alone can answer our prayers and bring us into his kingdom. Let's just pray to God. Lord, we just thank you for this word we have this morning. Oh Lord, we've written to your church in Colossae, but it still applies to our lives. <clears throat> Help us to learn from it and apply it, Lord, in this week. Help us to give you the glory and the power that's due unto your holy name. That you are supreme, that one day you will come back and judge this world. Judge us not on what we have said or what we have done, but judge us in our relationship to you and our praise and glorify in Christ and how we have reached out to others in this community. We pray that you would guide us and direct us, Lord. Make us the people you want us to be and commit us into your holy name. For we ask it in your name too. Amen. We will now stand and worship God together in number 408 in Christ alone. <laughs>
see it from how we meet again. Let's just say together the grace. The grace yes. of our Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God.